Hi, seventh grade. Week one of our coronavirus quarantine. I hope you are at home cozy, um, getting some work done, following that schedule that we created together. It will help you, I promise, um, to get yourself organized and get things done when they're supposed to be. Remember, all week's assignments are due on Friday by midnight. On Monday, the following Monday, you will get a new email with your assignments for that week. Um, this first video is going to be Antius, your very first story, which is in this textbook that you took home last week. Um, this video will actually be part one and part two because this is kind of lengthy. So you can listen to both of those recordings or just one or neither if you think you got it. For the vocab words, you want to pay attention to the word resolute, domain, contemplate, shrewd, and sterile. And you also should think about your essay question for this week, which is what do you think is makes the better home, the city, or the country? So you can kind of pick up some ideas when you're reading this story. The story Antius starts on page 176, and I am going to begin. This was during the wartime when lots of people were coming north for jobs in factories and war industries, when people moved around a lot more than they do now, and sometimes kids were thrown into new groups and new lives that were completely different from anything they had ever known before. I remember this one kid, TJ, his name was from somewhere down south, whose family moved into our building during that time. They'd come north with everything they owned piled into the back seat of an old model sedan that you wouldn't expect to make the trip, with TJ and his three younger sisters riding shakily on top of the load of junk. Our building was just like all the others there, the f with families crowded into a few rooms, and I guess there were 25 or 30 kids about my age in that one building. Of course, there were a few of us who formed a gang and ran together all the time after school, and I was the one who brought TJ in and started the whole thing. The building right next door to us was a factory where they made wake walking dolls. It was a low building with a flat tarred roof that had a parapet all along it with about head high, and we found out a long time before that no one, not even the watchman, paid any attention to the roof because it was higher than any of the other buildings around. So my gang used the roof as headquarters. We could get up there by crisscrossing over the fire escape, a fire escape from our own roof on a plank and then going up on up. It was a secret place for us where no one else could go without permission. I remember the first day I took TJ up there to meet the gang. He was a stocky, robust kid with a shock of white hair, nothing sissy about him except his voice. He talked in this slow, gentle voice like you'd never heard before. He talked different from any of us and he noticed it right away, but I liked him anyway, so I told him to come on up. We climbed up over the parapet and dropped down onto the roof. The rest of the gang were already there. Hi, I said. I jerked my thumb at TJ. He just moved into the building yesterday. He just stood there, not scared or anything, just looking, like the first time you see somebody you're not you, not sure you're going to like. Hi, Blackie said. Where are you from? Marion County, TJ said. We laughed. Marion County, I said. Where's that? He looked at me for a moment like I was a stranger, too. It's in Alabama, he said, like I ought to know where it was. What's your name? Charlie said. TJ, he said, looking back at him. He had pale blue eyes that looked washed out, but he looked directly at Charlie, waiting for his reaction. He'll be all right, I thought. No sissy in him, except that voice. Who ever talked like that? TJ, Blackie said. That's just initials. What's your real name? Nobody in the world has just initials. I do, he said. And they're TJ. That's all the name I got. His voice was resolute. Resolute here means firm and purposeful or determined. His voice was resolute with the knowledge of his rightness, and for a moment, no one had anything to say. TJ looked around at the rooftop and down at the black tar under his feet. Down yonder where I come from, he said, we played out in the woods. Don't, ha don't you all have no woods around here? Nah, Blackie said. There is a park a few blocks over, but it's full of kids and cops and old women. You can't do a thing. TJ kept looking at the tar under his feet. You mean you ain't got no field to raise nothing in, no watermelons or nothing? Nah, I said scornfully. What do you want to grow something for? The folks can buy everything they need at the store. He looked at me again with that strange, unknowing look. In Marion County, he said, I had my own acre of cotton, my own acre of corn. It was mine to plant and make every year. He sounded like it was something to be proud of, and in an obscure way, it made the rest of us angry. Blackie said, Who'd want to have their, top of page 178, own acre of cotton and corn? That's just work. What can you do with an acre of cotton and corn? TJ looked at him. Well, you get to the, well, 
sorry. Well, you get part of the bale off in your acre, he said seriously, and I fed my acre of corn to my calf. We didn't really know what he was talking about, so we were more puzzled than angry. Otherwise, I guess, we'd have chased him off the roof and wouldn't let him be part of our game. But he was strange and different, and we were all attracted by his solid sense of rightness and belonging. Maybe the strange softness of his voice contrasting our own tones of speech into harshness. He moved his foot against the black tar. We could make our own field right here, he, he said softly, thoughtfully. Come spring, we could raise us what we want to, watermelons and garden trucks, and no one tell, no telling what all. You'd have to be a good farmer to make these tar roofs grow any watermelon, I said. We, la we all laughed. But TJ looked serious. We could haul us some dirt up here, he said, and spread it out even and water it, and before you know it, we'd have us a crop in here. He looked at us intently. Wouldn't that be fun? They wouldn't let us, Blackie said quickly. I thought you said this was all you, you all's roof, TJ said to me. That you all could do anything you wanted up here. They never bothered us, I said. I felt the idea beginning to catch fire in me. It was a big idea, and it took a while for it to sink in. But the more I thought about it, the better I liked it. Say, I said to the gang, he might have something there. Just make us a regular roof garden with flowers and grass and trees and everything. And all ours, too, I said. We wouldn't let anybody up here except the ones we wanted to. It'd take a while to grow trees, TJ said quickly, but we weren't paying attention to him. They were all talking about it suddenly, all excited with the idea after I'd put in a way they would catch hold of. Only rich people had roof gardens, we knew, and the idea of our own private domain excited them. Domain here means territory. We'd bring it up in sacks and boxes, Blackie said. We'd have to do it while the folks weren't paying any attention to, to us, for we'd have to come up the roof of our building and then cross over it. Where can we get the dirt, somebody said worriedly. One of those vacant lots over close to the school, Blackie said. Nobody'd notice if we scraped it up. I slapped TJ on the shoulder. Man, you have a wonderful idea, I said, and everybody grinned at him, remembering that he had started it. Our own private roof garden. He grinned back. It'll be ourn, he said. Our on. All arn. Then he looked thoughtfully again. Maybe I can lay my hands on some cotton seed, too. You think we could raise us some cotton? We'd started big projects before at one time or another, like any gang of kids, but they always petered out for lack of organization and direction. But this one didn't. Somehow or other, TJ kept it going all through the winter months. He kept talking about the watermelons and the cotton we raised come spring. And when even that wouldn't work, he'd switch around my idea of flowers and grass and trees though he was always honest enough to add that it would take a while to get any tree started. Top of page 179. He always had it in his mind, and he'd mentioned at school, getting them lined up to carry dirt that afternoon, saying in a casual way that he'd reckon a few more weeks ought to see the job through. Our little area of private earth grew slowly. TJ was smart enough to start in one corner of the building, heaping up carried earths two or three feet thick so that we had an immediate result to look at, to contemplate with awe. Contemplate here means consider, look at, or think carefully. Some of the evenings, TJ alone was carrying Earth up to the building, the rest of the gang distracted by other enterprises or interests. But TJ kept plugging along on his own, Eventually, and eventually we'd all come back to him again, and then our own little acre would grow more rapidly. He was careful about the kind of dirt he'd let us carry up there, and more than once he dumped a sandy load over the parapet into the airway, area way below because it wasn't good enough. He found out the kinds of earth in all the vacant lots from blocks around. He'd pick it up and feel it and smell it, frozen though it was it was sometimes, and then he'd say it was good growing soil or it wasn't worth anything and we'd have to go on somewhere else. Thinking about it now, I don't see how he kept us at it. It was hard work, lugging paper sacks and boxes of dirt all the way up the stairs of our own buildings, keeping out of the way of the grown-ups so they wouldn't catch on to what we were doing. They probably wouldn't have cared. But they didn't pay much attention to us, but we wanted to keep it secret anyway. Then we'd have to go through the trap door to our roof, teeter over the plank to the fire escape, then climb two or three stories to the parapet and drop them down onto the roof. All that for a small pile of earth, pile of earth that sometimes didn't seem worth the effort. But TJ kept the vision bright within us, his words shrewd and calculated to, toward the fulfillment of his dream. Shrewd here means clever. And he worked harder than any of us. He seemed driven toward the goal that we couldn't see, a particular point in time that would be definitely marked by signs and wonder that only he could see. 
The lab laborious earth just lay there during the cold months, inert and likeness, the clods lumpy, lumpy and cold under our feet when we walked over it. But one day it rained, and afterward there was a softness in the air, and the earth was live and giving again with moisture and warmth. That evening, T.J. smelled the air, his nostrils dilating with the odor of the earth under his feet. It's spring, he said, and there was a gladness rising in his voice that filled us all with the same feeling. It's mighty late for it, but it's spring. I just about decided it was never going to get here at all. We were all sniffing the air, too, trying to smell the way, smell it the way T.J. did, and I can still remember the sweet odor of earth under our feet. It was the first time in my life that spring and spring earth had meant the same thing, anything to me. I looked at TJ then, knowing in a faint way the hunger within him through the toilsome winter months, knowing the dream that lay behind his plan. He was a new Antaeus, preparing his own bed of strength. Planting time, he said. We'll have to find us some seed. What do we do, Blackie said. How do we do it? And that is where we're going to stop the top of page 180. To continue this story, please check out video part two of Antaeus. Thanks, guys. Stay safe and wash your hands.